Hi, and welcome to the second session on Researching Crisis and Disasters, a Historical Overview and Selected Methodological Issues. Bianca Villar here from La Salle Universitat Ramon Llull. In the previous session, we looked at how crisis and disaster research evolved through the years. We also found that the more the field developed, the more thoughtful the conceptualization of the terms disaster and crisis have become. We also concluded with an argument that the resulting research design depends on the treatment of the researcher. In this section, I'd like to give an overview of two methodologies used to understand a crisis or a disaster. These are survey research and field studies. And then I'd also like to show the issues that make disaster and crisis research unique. Of course, methodological techniques like survey research or field studies are not very different from methods used in studying non-crisis or non-disaster phenomena in social sciences. However, crisis or disasters tend to create special or aggravated issues in implementing a certain research design. Indeed, both crisis and disasters share a common characteristic of what Arjen Boyne and other scholars termed as unness, unexpected, undesirable, unimaginable, and often unmanageable. This is what we want to learn in this session, exactly what are the methods employed in disaster and crisis research. So we'll be looking at the common ones only, survey and field studies, and what are the issues that make the conduct of research in this field special. Robert Stallings in 2004 argued that there are three prominent issues in the conduct of crisis and disaster research. First is timing. When does the process of collecting data from a disaster or a crisis take place? Is it too soon or too late after the crisis or the disaster to be collecting data? The second issue is access. Does the researcher have an in on the informants, survey respondents, and holders of the information? And last, generalizability. Is there enough argument to draw valid conclusions from the studies? Of course, these issues are interrelated because the ability to draw valid conclusions is directly affected by the successful resolution of issues of timing and access. Meanwhile, access is affected considerably by timing issues. Now, let's have a closer look at how these issues affect the implementation of some of the most commonly used methods in disaster research, field studies and survey research. Field research is a qualitative research technique and is considered to be the most common method employed by disaster and crisis researchers. Imagine the scenario. A researcher or a group of researchers learn of a kind of disaster through media outlets. Ideally, they would already have an agenda as to what types of disasters or crises are theoretically interesting to them. So arriving on site as soon as possible is often seen by researchers as key success factor to their work. The decision to launch a study has to be made quickly. Of course, certain other considerations need to be taken into account while time is running. That includes funds, the health and security of the researchers, the logistics of getting to the site, among other things. While the researchers are on site, they will try to employ various strategies of data collection, including non-participant observation in different posts depending on the research inquiry. So this might mean the community and shelters, command posts, hospitals, or disaster one-stop centers. Those who employ this technique often have research diaries that have timestamps, and they also take pictures or videos of various artifacts that might be interesting to their study. This technique is also often complemented by interviews, although with a lot of consideration for the emotional well-being of the people they are interviewing, since most of them might have been traumatized by the experience. At all times, researchers must be alert about the types of documents that might be useful for their study. The field visit often lasts a few days to a few weeks. Sometimes one field visit is enough to get all the data needed by the researcher. But there are also other times when researchers deem it necessary to conduct a follow-up visit. Researchers usually learn about the occurrence of a disaster the way the general public does. The topic to be investigated depends largely on the time the reports are received and, of course, on the research interests of the group. The sooner such events are brought to the attention of the research group, the sooner they can convene to talk about the possibility of deploying a team on site. For example, research groups are typically warned of an impending typhoon and if they find this to be aligned with their research agenda, then they can be deployed before the typhoon hits. For certain disasters, though, that were unprecedented, as was the case in the 2004 Asian tsunami, research groups arrive on site a few days or weeks later. Time also poses sensitivity issues. Researchers have to be discerning when it comes to gathering data. 
If they arrive too early, there can be ethical concerns as to taking advantage of the vulnerability of the informants. There can also be validity concerns as to obtaining sensationalized data. However, if they arrive too late, then there can be concerns as to the recall bias of the informants. Are we sure they are able to remember what really happened? Initial deployment of the team is also complicated because the initial reports tend to be inaccurate. The decision to launch a study relies on initial estimates of damage, and this must be done quickly. In effect, research groups can actually be making a call with inaccurate information. Now let's look at issues of access. As mentioned earlier, one of the reasons time is an important factor to be addressed in carrying out field studies is because time affords access to the data. Researchers favor immediate access to data because they can become difficult, if not impossible, to access at a much later time. Researchers refer to this as ephemeral or perishable data. Indeed, it can be quite difficult to reenact what exactly transpired during a crisis or a disaster. For example, if a researcher is particularly interested in the coordination dynamics among high-level persona from different autonomous organizations, observing it firsthand is more ideal because the researcher can take notes on the body language, and also have an outsider peek into the dynamics among the key decision makers. The data will not be the same as when the person being interviewed is recalling and interpreting what transpired during that time. Another issue in relation to access is actually getting hold of the right people. Researchers who don't have established links with a gatekeeper can be directed to the designated public information office, which is considered a one-stop shop for general information related to the situation. However, researchers seek to get information that are more specific to their research inquiry, and oftentimes the information provided by the public information office is just too general. Now, another situation that makes access difficult, especially in large-scale, highly publicized disasters, is the convergence of researchers. Convergence in this context is defined as the movement of material, information, and especially people toward the disaster site from the outside area. In other words, there is just too much for a disaster site to contain. Highly publicized disasters can also attract both veteran and novice disaster researchers. Sometimes, this can cause redundancy in work. It can also cause competition among various researchers represented by different institutions, and this can pose a potential harm to the informants. Now let's see how field research is affected by the issue of generalizability. The goal of all science is to arrive at conclusions that can be generalized to a wider application base, and this of course includes the social sciences. The limits of generalization, which is knowing when they apply and when they don't apply, are just as important. This is precisely the reason why the definition of a crisis and a disaster, as was discussed earlier, is so important in this field. We need to know what types of events can our findings in disaster and crisis research be applicable. Just as time affects access to disaster sites, so too does access affect generalizability. One of the more prominent ways in which access affects generalizability has something to do with the sample points. Note that the case for generalizability depends largely on sound data. Where no access to data exists, no generalizability can follow. However, even if one has access to data, we also have to remember that most sampling strategies employed by disaster and crisis researchers are non-probabilistic. Disaster and crisis researchers often rely on purposive sampling, more specifically snowball sampling, where one informant helps them gain access to another informant. Some scholars shun this kind of research, though it's not really bad. One way to address this is to argue for what Yin, for example, would call analytical generalizability instead of data generalizability. Another issue of generalizability in field research is the sample size. Disaster and crisis sites are often contained in a specific area and the number of people to be interviewed can be limited. A way to address this is by means of replication. Multiple studies can be conducted in different settings inquiring the same phenomena and then see how the results compare. Now that we've seen the issues related to field studies, it's time to see whether they're the same or different in survey research. Let's look at it in the next video.